Welcome to the second part in this mini-series charting my progress as I paint some French cuirassiers from Perry miniatures. This is how we left the miniatures at the end of the last part, having covered blocking in colours ready for the next stages. And this is how they look now, with 80% of the layers and highlights applied to both the rider and the saddle furniture. And that's what we'll be covering in this video. If you haven't watched the previous video, which shows how we got to the stage before this by blocking in the colours, I'd encourage you to do so. Otherwise, first, let's have a look how we got them from the end of part one to as they look now in part two. So welcome to a, a sped up recap of the stages that I've gone through since the first video. I wish I painted this fast in real life because my collection would be complete a lot quicker, although I'd probably just buy more. This is me going up through the stages of doing both the epaulettes and to a certain extent the cuirass liner. I did paint the cuirass liner a slightly different shade of red actually and um, spared it some extreme highlights because it just didn't need it and I wanted a different tone. In terms of the difference between the words highlight and layers in the caption, that's kind of academic. Um, I tend to refer la layers as the sort of foundation or base layer that goes on. I mean a highlight is a form of layer at the end of the day. Um, but this is just me taking it up through the different highlight steps up to completion and then the difference really is the fact that the line didn't need it because it was also going to get a, a layer of piping on it and that's the completed version of the reds on those features. Then for the jacket this is using an aforementioned uh, easy process which is the foundry triad number 65 which works really well but doesn't show up particularly well at this stage in the process when other brighter colours haven't surrounded it yet. This is the piping going on. In this case, I have specifically said layer because the first thing I've done is put on a, a light gray tone where the piping is going to sit just to help bring the, the white out that the actual color is that's going to go on top. So straps and um, straps actually, and also gloves will be included in some of these stages. Um, there are what I would say a couple of layers involved. Um, I do do the most sort of medium gray sort of tone and then move on to uh, tans and beiges and, and move it steadily up through what you might describe as ivory and so on. It's definitely worth it to go through the whole process in the case of these parts of the miniature, just to get that nice, rich, sort of slightly creamy white tone that I put on straps and gloves. That's a different shade to the white greyish done process that I use for um, white uniform and miniatures. Um, and the, indeed the breeches on these are painted differently as well. And then this is the final most extreme highlight as you can see here, just putting on that lightest white tone on the most raised details of the miniature to really help it pop. Um, I maintain my single piece of advice for painting white, which is don't try and paint white white, certainly not straight away. And I wouldn't even do it over a single um, based gray layer. I like to work up to get a nice rich color. This is the cloak. Uh, I took a sort of specific liberty decision when it comes to the artistic license on this. Uh, I'm aware that the cloak should have the facing colour as part of the liner, um, but these guys have not got that. So they've got um, a sort of lightish grey and beige colour um, and you can make your own decisions as to as to which is which. It doesn't really matter. Actually, this the, the cloak rolls on these miniatures are sculpted differently on some of them. Um, and here you go, the second highlight. This mostly shows actually that I don't put the same number of highlights and or layers on all different parts of the miniature, depending on where it sits and, and what I'm trying to achieve. I could do, but I don't do in every situation. And here are the not yet finished, but very much advanced Carassier. So hopefully it's evident that they've advanced significantly since the last video. Um, the time lapses having gone through, not all the stages I've done, but most of them, I didn't want to uh, bore you by even having at speed to watch the multiple stages of some of the highlights. Uh, and you'll notice that in the speeded up segments, I've only featured the uh, four Crassier miniatures on this end of the line here uh, and not the others, just for consistency's sake. And it was easier to film. Um, but yeah, they've moved on quite far, so I'll give you some uh, close-up views of some of them. Uh, so, if we, can, if we pick this one out, which is one of the miniatures that's been featured um, during, you'll see that in terms of details that I've finished, 
Uh, we've done the white cross belt, the gloves, the breeches. Uh, we've done the red and white trim that sits underneath the cuirass. Uh, epaulettes, the blue jacket on this miniature. There are two miniatures with brown jackets. Um, we've done the brass fittings, although I might put a couple of extra little highlight details on those. Uh, flipping it round. Uh, the portmanteau um, isn't quite complete because obviously I haven't done the white trim on the saddle cloth or the portmanteau. I will be hand painting in both the little grenade badge and the uh, regimental number onto the end of the portmanteau. Um, I have done the trimming on the edge of the shabrak and the uh, the facing colours, which is that um, wine dregs colour for this regiment as described in the last video. Um, and you can see that the, the, the metal, which is already done, is now complemented in the case of the um, sword with the uh, brass fittings of the handle as well. And there you go. I have also done the rolled cape on the top of the portmanteau. What I'll say about that is that I'm aware that the Cuirassier Regiment had uh, the the inner lining was the same colour as their facing. In this case, I've gone for a, a grey and beige two-tone on the rolls. They are slightly different on some of the different miniatures in the way that they've been sculpted. So you can see here, this one is a different proportion. And I've gone with this on the basis of the fact that they've been in Spain, resources have been harder to come by. Um, they've come into Germany and the army having been cobbled together, they've been issued whatever they can find and whatever is serviceable. So it's a good pose, this one, this guy just adjusting his helmet and his chin scales. Um, in terms of other details yet to do, um, I have not done the shabrak itself. Um, the, ed the white edging, as already discussed. Uh, and what else? Um, pivot it back around this way. Um, I haven't done the flesh tones or any of the hair. Uh, and I haven't done any of the black straps um, that run on the um, rider and um, horse furniture parts of the miniature. I clearly haven't done the horse at all, but the horse will be done separately after the rider. So yeah, it's mostly the black areas are going to be the, the largest amount of work. Um, so the crest on the helmet, um, the trimming around the front of the helmet, uh, and as I say, all the straps and then the boots and so on. And those are the main details yet to be completed. And here you've got the um, officer. I chose to extend the brass fitting up where the horsehair ball sort of would normally sit to make him stand out a little bit more. And although it should probably be white, I opted for a red tassel on the hilt of his sword as I prefer it as a spot colour to break up the rest of the miniature. And then the other miniature of interest which didn't feature in the rest of the video, which is the trumpeter here who's a, a really nice sculpt. There's something very pleasing about this miniature. I haven't quite put my finger on what it is yet, but... There you go. Um, he's got black... Um, he's got a black shabrac on the uh, horse there. Also, the plume might well be meant to be white, um, but I've taken a, an artistic license decision. I haven't finished the trumpet yet either on this guy. Um, to basically give him the same um, the black plume and distinctives as the rest of the Carassier helmet um, just out of personal preference I think it kind of looks right and again I can self-justify on the grounds that um, perhaps just that's what they've been using that's what was available to the unit as it was operating in Spain as it was transferred as it's you know whatever replacement he's been able to pick up I just think that that black on top will um, distinguish the miniature better than putting more of that white color on it Just a word on colours that I've been using for these. So in the previous video um, and in the, one of the comments that I answered, there's some questions about um, paints. So um, one of my favourite new acquisitions are the uh, Scale 75 paints. So they're, they're metal range for the silvery metals. Um, I've got a series of these that I've been using. Um, and that's what was used um, to paint the different uh, metal distinctives on these. So parts of the helmet, the cuirass, the scabbard, etc. Um, and the quality of um, Scale 75 Metallics um, is excellent. 
Um, I heartily recommend them. These are um, airbrush paints as well, but I'm quite happy to use them with a brush. I have used them um, through the airbrush as well. That they've got a really smooth um, texture when you apply them, um, and the sort of the pick the pigment, the metal content of them um, is is not enormously visible. Um, as some paints do, they're perhaps I don't know, maybe coarse is the way to describe them. This is a really smooth. Um, nice set of metallics that complement each each other very very well uh, and I use the golds as seen here um, a series of those um, to go up through the uh, brass brass parts of the miniatures apart from that um, the main paints I use are, are Vallejo paints um, which should be familiar to all um, so this range the, the model color paints um, and then I do have some foundry paints. So in the case of the blues for the um, French here, I have used uh, the foundry paint system. I'm a big fan of this. So the uh, 65 Alpha Triad French blue. Um, so that's the Alpha Bravo and Charlie paints. Um, and they go on really, really well. And it's a really nice dark blue. Um, I would say that I think for the very, very top color, um, if you wanted to push it a little bit more, um, and mix a, a different, a lighter blue into this one, which is the, the top highlight color, as it were, um, you could do just to pick out the really raised edges. And that would perhaps um, bring bring the uh, bring the color out a little bit more with that top highlight. But um, it perhaps doesn't, doesn't matter under, under the right light. And once a matte varnish goes onto this, um, I actually quite like the subtlety of the, of the found, foundry triad as it applies itself. And the same for the, the green version I have. Um, I do have a few citadel paints here and there, um, but not a huge amount. I'm basically 95% Vallejo these days. So for example, I've got, you know, a citadel Mifs and Red. I do use um, citadel washes. I'm a big fan of those. Um, so for example, I used a combination of, um, this is not all of them, but just as an example, um, uh, Vallejo paints and um, some citadel products. Um, so in this case, using the darker reds for the sort of foundation color and the base color, and then working up through the um, colors above it. I do mix when it comes to red. I've found that helps for certain miniatures and certain details. So in this case, I've used base red. I don't think it was actually this one. I think it was the dark red, um, as I described in the last video. Then applied this wash on because, for example, on the epaulettes, that just helps me pick out the details a little bit better because it settles into the recesses and it's an area that I want two layers on anyway. So it's just a, it's just an assistance really that I don't obscure anything I want to pick out later on. And then I've worked progressively up through lighter shades. Um, actually, I've got a series of Vallejo um, colours that will go on one after the other as a reasonable uh, set of highlights. But um, if I'm actually pushing it a little bit further, then I would strongly suggest you 50-50 um, between each layer. So if this was your um, first color and this was your second, um, then you might want actually to mix these 50-50 and make that your second color and then this lighter color to be the, the third one, the one goes on top of that. Um, but that's some of the paints I use and some of the, the basically I apply that process um, to the whole miniature regardless of which bit of it I'm painting without a great deal of variation. Um, I know that uh, there were some questions about uh, flesh tones and how I paint those in the comments as well um, and actually the easy answer is I follow the basically the same process I've just described but what I will do is um, either include in a video that I will already be filming or perhaps do a short bespoke video um, a little not tutorial, but guide to how I do flesh tones, particularly on faces, um, similar to the one that I'm working on for painting white uniforms, because I know there's been uh, quite a few requests for how I go about that and making different shades of white come out. Anyway, that's the stage that I've reached um, with these. Um, in the third video in the series, when we come back, I will have completed the riders, maybe not the horses, but definitely the riders and have varnished them in. Um, and then I probably won't do a, a fourth part. I don't want the series to run on too long where I go through how I paint the horses. It's not a particularly interesting process. Um, I think people would probably rather see a, the final video as the miniatures completed and based. And that is the, the last part of the series that I will create. Just as some final thoughts um, in terms of tips on painting. Um, if not this specific set of miniatures, then certainly very similar ones because there are um, other very fine packs available from Perry of their different cavalry models, including um, Carassier. 
um, is as discussed in the last video that sometimes you get um, tips on how to paint miniatures by working from sort of inside out as it were um, which I think I said in the last video I don't always do on miniatures however with these because of the nature of the poses creating um, slightly irregular depths than you might otherwise expect you know there's not they're, they're all different so there's no sort of consistent way that you can paint um, details or they don't sit in such a way as you can access the details um, to an equal degree is that I would recommend painting things that are the most recessed on particularly these miniatures or others that are similar first. Um, so that is why I did the metals first because as you can see here you've got that part of the cuirass that sits right inside there. Um, what I don't like worrying about is you know painting other details around something and then trying to reach into the figure as it were um, because I would be extremely worried about um, accidentally you know, getting a little bit of paint anywhere, even a tiny dot um, I find dries quite quickly for me and will be quite hard to rectify. Um, it's why, for example, I, I don't, as I said in the last one, I think, do the faces first, because if I were to do this face to a really nice standard that I liked and then be working around at details around it and accidentally just glance something, slip something, you know, have some runoff go into some of the details. I've then got to worry about recovering that and it might not do it properly. You may find that as you do it, you've got, you know, staining over part of the detail that you've you've painstakingly painted. So I'd certainly recommend, yeah, on, on models where there's a lot of really nicely sculpted details, different um, elevations on the sculpt, different raised details that try and work from areas of the miniature that are the lowest, as it were, that in terms of their contours or, or however you want to describe it and then work outwards as far as possible. Um, there are bits of it that you know you can fudge that rule on um, and I think really it just comes down to um, a bit of personal preference and um, an instinct for uh, painting the miniatures that you'll basically gain I think through experience of doing different things and working out you know how techniques work best for you. But yeah I would uh, I definitely suggest that one of the things to do um, before you paint a miniature, apart from your research on perhaps the uniform that you want to paint for the period, um, any specific unit details or little um, you know, tricks and bits and pieces that you want to apply to them, um, is actually do some prep work and planning on the um, on the miniatures themselves and like how best do I go about painting these miniatures? You know, do I need to alter anything that I would normally do? Um, I mean, really good miniatures like these have been a pleasure to paint um, and, you know, well sculpted miniatures. A good sculpt for me includes the way it aids the painter um, in bringing it to life. Um, and I, in this case, part of the quality of these Perry sculpts is that um, they absolutely achieve that. Anyway, that's just my um, quick thoughts on perhaps um, the process you might go through in, in planning how to go about painting miniatures so you get the most out of both the miniature themselves and the experience of painting them. Um, join me again in the next video um, where, as I say, these will have been uh, completed in terms of their riders uh, and matte varnished and you can see the remaining steps that have been taken to, to complete them and I'll go over any other little tips and techniques that I've, I've used in the process between those videos. Um, I hope to see you then and in the meantime, happy hobbying.